In the mid-90s, the rivalry competition between the Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis of their 2D games was slowly coming to an end for a new console era for 3D games. With the Nintendo 64, Sega Saturn, along with the new console on the rise to PlayStation making their introduction in the gaming market, Nintendo and Sega, two of the biggest names in the gaming industry, still decided to give a little bit more support for their previous consoles. Today, I'll be doing an in-depth review of one of Sega's console-exclusive gaming mask guide. No, not the Blue Hedgehog. I'll talk about his games later on next time. No, believe it or not, there was once going to be another person to take Sonic's place as an IP representative for Sega after him. And yeah, there were also a lot of gaming mascots in the early to late 90s by game developers, some others even being made by the console manufacturers themselves, such as the case for this mascot. Star. If the mascot design looks familiar or a little Sonic-like, well, I mean, like I said before, I should emphasize, there were a lot of mascots in the gaming industry trying to capitalize off the success of Mario and Sonic. And I do mean... a lot. But I digress. Point is, the reasoning of that is, Rystar was made and developed by Sonic Team! Yeah, the guys that were responsible for making some of the best Sonic games! and some of the infamously worst. Depending on which Sonic fan you ask. The people who were specifically responsible for making the game were Yuji Naka, who programmed the game, and Yuji Yukawa, the artist for the character and his first game to work on and would later do his artwork on other Sonic games that became well known and iconic throughout the Sonic fanbase. They both worked on the Sonic series, with Naka leaving the series and Sega as a whole in 2006. With this game being his last involvement in the series and the company as a whole. No way! Yeah. As for Yuji Yukawa, he still stayed with Sega and the Sonic franchise as a whole and is still making Sonic artwork for the company to this very day. If you guys are not familiar with his work, please check it out, it is really cool stuff. And heck, the Yellow Star can be even more linked to the Blue Hedgehog, because it was built on the same engine for the original first Sonic the Hedgehog Genesis game, along with the levels and the music. By the way, if any of you have any time, you should check out the prototype of this game. It's really interesting. There are a lot of title, gameplay, graphical, audio, stage, and text changes that went into or unused in this game, including Ristar's original design. He looks more like a knockoff of the Snorks. Uh, I'll say it's like, it's like, you know, totally snorky. And to add on to that, it seems that this was also debated as of being one of Sonic's first game ever. That's a fun fact that I never knew back then. Throughout this video, I'm going to be looking into Sega's most obscure and really unpopular mascot, but not on the original Sega Genesis, because I don't own one. No, I was introduced to Ristar on the Sonic Ultimate Genesis Collection for the Xbox 360 that I was given by some friends of mine on my 11th or 12th birthday. And while I could just use that for a substitute for this review, I want to keep it a little authentic by playing an emulated ROM version on the Genesis Mini. And I wouldn't encourage this, but if you can't afford the game, which it shouldn't really cost that much, or want to see for yourself how the game is, you could play an emulated version of the game online, which I gotten from installing the Project Lunar app and downloaded the emulated game on any site like I did. Which Sega doesn't seem to mind and is okay with. And yeah, this might be cheating a bit, but it's close to the Genesis feel, what with the controller and console design, and the fact that this mini console was manufactured by Sega themselves, minus the cartridge use. But even if I did have the original Genesis game, it would possibly be a little complicated to capture some gameplay footage because I'm using an Elgato HD60 with an HDMI input and output to record my gameplay, and it doesn't have an S video output on it, so there's that. Anyways, without further delay, let's get into this review. In a far off galaxy, an evil alien force is at work. The 
evil tyrant Greedy has corrupted the planet leaders and enslaved the populace. Even the legendary hero has been captured. A desperate plea for help is made. by the hero's own son. Rise Star! So, yeah, ignoring the serious summarization of the story by the anonymous narrator, the plot is pretty downplayed. The story begins in space, a solar system called Valdi has six planets. Planet Flora, Planet Undertow, Planet Scorch, Planet Sonata, Planet Freon, and Planet Automaton living in peaceful harmony. Till one evil tyrant named Greedy invaded every of the six planets to rule and brainwashed every leader of those planets and the legendary hero to command to his pleas. Somehow. But as stated by the narrator, a desperate plea of help was made and answered by the hero's son, Rystar. So now it's up to Rystar to stop the evil Greedy and save all six planets and galaxy from his reign. Yeah, the story is a little basic and nothing special considering this was made in a time a little before games decided to have stories. By the way, remember earlier when I talked about different changes made for the game? Well, so was the story for it. In the Mega Drive version for Japan and Europe, Rystar was called again to save the planets and was implied to be created by this character, a lady named Uruto, a star goddess. Or maybe an implied wife of the legendary hero who you see, well, kind of see, you only get to see his arms, not his face, of what he looks like or anything showed at the end of the Genesis when you beat it. Then again, if Care Bears 2 or maybe even Teletubbies to a small extent have taught me anything is that seeing a big star-like face with eyes and a smile looking down at you would maybe make some people... uncomfortable? <laughs> and I believe it's mentioned that Uruto is actually Rystar's mother too. Well, if that's true, what an irresponsible mother endangering your kid to save the world. Get up yourself and get an army or some sort of forces of resistance. I assume you're royalty of some sort, or heck, you are a god, right? Says so in your bio. I would assume a god can do about almost everything in their power to triumph over evil doing. You reckless, lazy bitch! Anyways, the story for the game isn't bad. It's okay for what it did. Bad guy doing evil generic thing, hero goes and stop him. But hey, the story isn't always everything in video games. How's the gameplay for the... Game. Well, you play as the titular character Rystar, obviously. And as all basic 2D platformers, you can move left, right, jump, but there's more than meets the eye. You can grab enemies or objects and sort of slingshot yourself to attack them or grab an object by stretching his arms. A trait introduced that the character might be well known for that differentiate himself from other platforming mascots. Well, maybe there's Rayman, but he came out seven months after Rystar and he's also limbless. So, kind of? By the way, sort of a related note, this mechanic of arm stretching would be followed up again 13 years later by Sonic Team, who would see in Sonic Unleashed. <laughs> Yet another kind of bizarre link to this specific series again. Rystar might be extremely different compared to other platformers like Mario, Sonic, and Mega Man, which I think can be really telling. He isn't as fast like the three, which for some level design like these, it does make some sense. And his jumps feels heavier than compared to them. And sometimes can screw you over a little bit when you want to jump over certain obstacles that you could land on that you didn't want to can hurt you if you don't press the jump button too early. Throughout the game, you'll be grabbing on ladders bars, poles, and swinging on specific objects to project yourself to land on specific platforms you want. In every planet's level, there are items placed around for you to find. Said items that is in the game are yellow stars, which can restore your health one at a time if you get hit or attacked. Silver stars, which personally to me looks more blue than silver, or I'm just colorblind. 
These can restore all your health together if you lose one of your stars left in your health bar. These little stars that are modeled after Rystar that gives you extra lives, and these yellow jewels that give you score points. On the topic of score points, throughout every level in the game, you can attack any enemy or collect many of the yellow jewels to increase your score. The higher your score gets, you'll be rewarded with an extra life. You can collect the items by finding either a treasure chest, holes, and grabbing and hitting certain walls that will give you whatever. But be cautious, because when I said they'll give you whatever, in some chances it can possibly include enemies from Greedy's army, which I came across a couple of times and gotten killed in some instances. Speaking of enemies, in the game you'll come across some that'll be reoccurring, specifically more of Greedy's army and no one else. Some that don't appear in other planet's levels are the denizens of Valgi from every planet that represents their specific planet's environment you're on that Greedy brainwashed into doing bad things and trying to stop Rystar. Which by the way, when Rystar is faced up against the citizens, he just... KILLS THEM! Okay, that's a bit of an exaggeration. It is implied that Rystar did save the citizens across the galaxy by knocking them out. So less homicide and more assaulting. Yeah, I guess that makes it better. Anyways, the next and last item you'll need is the little star statue that is black and white. To me, the white looked more silver, unlike the said silver star to me. Again, I'm possibly colorblind or something is clearly wrong with me you can use as a decoy to avoid and get through traps to finish the level. Yeah, level, as in singular, as in you'll only use this as it'll only be mandatory in one level in the whole game, and that's Planet Scorch. The levels in the game can vary sometimes. It's not all that hard, but it can be a little frustrating at times. Like the level of Planet Scorch, as I mentioned before, can really test my patience. Well, okay, I'm not saying it's entirely hard. I mean, when you start the level, it's really easy. It's only at the end of the level where it can be time-consuming of having to do a pattern mini-game. Here's how it works. You need to grab every one of Greedy's Orbit minions in the exact same order the game wants. Every time you get it right, the pace of the pattern gets faster and changes the order of the pattern. Which can maybe screw you over if you're not paying attention. Or you have really bad memory. Then, if you get it wrong, the flames from Planet Scorch will rise up and damage you, which can sometimes be annoying or a hassle. And if it's not the flame, sometimes even jumping over the enemies in a specific awkward position can be a task in itself. As I stated before, when you press the jump button, you don't get much height, and when you need to land, it'll not always be precise of where you want it to be, and you could land on top of the enemy and damage yourself. This is possibly not a big issue if you know what you're doing, but for me, personally, it's just unnecessarily frustratingly gimmicky and could have gone without the game. Anyways, as for everything else, I didn't really have that much of a problem with. I mean, I guess Planet Sonata Round 2 can get a little crazy at some parts with using what I think to be drums as trampolines to get through high places, but sometimes it can try to psych you out on specific instances. Like, when you bounce on the drums and come across a pole, you'll need to grab them in order to get through the level, which can have spikes that can hurt you, or if you have one star health left from trying the best to avoid hazards, it could get somewhat bothersome. Which, the more time I was thinking, it might have been my fault personally, because the whole game to me felt like trial and error, like Mega Man, Crash Bandicoot, or Cuphead in some sort. Rystar also have water levels in the levels Planet Undertow and the second round in Planet Freon, where you'll be swimming most of the times. Water levels in video games sort of get a bad rep nowadays, but in Rystar's case, I think it was handled kind of fine here. You can swim up and down and all around in any specific directions. Pressing the action button to speed yourself up and also grab and hit enemies or objects underwater as you could on surface. Not much to add here, but overall, I just thought it was okay. Now, on the bosses, they are a whole other story. When you complete each round from every planet, you go to face the planet's leader, who as I said before, are being brainwashed or controlled by Greedy or his minions. As can be shown, the Elder and Riho, more specifically Riho, Osat, which sounds a little like a swear word, like... Oh shat. <laughs> 
I'm so immature. Out of hand, I will whack in a more uranium and inonious and inonious a inonious a inani a inani a inani another one of greedy's minions. Then finally, greedy. The whole entire boss fights can vary between the little easy to frustratingly challenging. Riho's fight can be manageable. You need to move left and right and don't get hit and dodge the mind controlled elder, bringing down his special attack or wind attack that'll keep you in place as some sort of paralysis for Riho to drop on you. Grab and hit the elder three times, then grab and hit Riho. Rinse and repeat two more times and he'll be finished. Osat is second. You just swim left and right to dodge the falling debris that he created. And when you see him swimming past by in the background, get ready to hit him because he'll be charging at you fast. Then he'll start to change it up a bit. When you see him stop and charging in fast at you again, either left or right, then make sure to react fast by swimming up in the air to dodge his charge attack. He'll do the same thing with a bunch of his fish army, so just do the same thing. Rinse and repeat three more times. The third is at a hand, where the game gets a little more challenging. First, you'll need to move fast left or right to dodge big rocks he tries to throw at you in the background. Afterwards, you'll also see him in the background digging underneath the ground. Move quickly either to the far left or right, because he'll try to attack you by digging up from underground with his razor sharp claws you'll need to avoid, and then he'll go up in the air and try to literally throw in the first punch. You should walk underneath and wait out his aerial attack. Afterwards, he'll try to either land back on the ground and do a sand attack or throw his razor sharp claws again, jump over to avoid them, and then hit him. Then he'll try to dig underground again, but he'll try to bring you and the whole floor down. Now you need to fight him while falling. He'll try to attack you in the same direction you'll be falling, so be careful. Grab him in the ass underneath, you're golden. Just hit him six times and that'll be that. By the way, when you beat Adahan, you'll see his armor break apart and see a miniature version of himself, and he'll try to attack you with his sand attack with no avail, which is kind of hilarious. <laughs> Next is Elowek. His name sounds like something you try to say in French. Eh, oui, oui, I am Elowek. <laughs> This is where the game starts to show its challenge. You'll first need to hit the bird perch that Elowek will use to sing on, where there will be music notes from Elowek coming at you that you'll need to dodge like crazy. When Elowek is done singing, hit the perch three times, then he'll fall off and then trip all over. Elowek will then fly up and try to squash you by falling on top of you and molting his feathers on you, so be sure to dodge those as well. He'll also try to charge in at you if you're ever a little far away from him. Follow the pattern, rinse and repeat four times. But for a hole, hit him a total of eight times and he'll be done. Now for Itamore, who was sent by Greedy to take care of Rystar. He can be easy to beat if you constantly just throw hot soup in his mouth brought by one of the inhabitants of Freon, the young by Head. Whenever he opens his mouth or tries to suck you in, you'll have to. Everyone, <sighs> rinse and repeat, repeat and a total repeat. of four times. Oh, I don't get paid enough for this shit. And then hit him in his stomach to finish it. The last boss fight, well, specifically the last planet boss fight until the next one. And next one. And that boss would be Uranium Power. When you enter the boss fight, you're shown and introduced to TV screens in the background with Uranium on screen. When you see him holding a screw bolt, make sure to jump quickly to dodge it because he's throwing it at you. And as for the boss fight itself, it's really easy. You can just constantly spam the grab button to hit him a total of 30 times, and whenever he lies down on the floor, his inventor, Ennoyus, who you can see controlling a crane in the background will try to aim it to hit you. Make sure to get near Uranium and let the crane hit him and then, you know, repeat the process, etc. Now it's time for the last two final bosses, which are in the same level. The first is Inani... Inoyes... Inani... Inani... The guy that invented Uranium Power and works for Greedy. 
You'll have to fight his battle mech, which has force fields you'll need to take down. Laser shooting that you have to avoid, and a boomerang that he'll shoot out that you need to time yourself to grab and hit because it'll be spinning and going around everywhere. For this, it's all entirely based on luck, which I had a hard time at first getting through, but if you use your skills to your advantage, it'll possibly get easier. Hit him four times and he's done. Now it's time to face the man, the myth, the legend, Greedy, in his ship. This is the final boss where you need to fight for your life, and it's all a matter of skills and pattern. Greedy will first send his orbits at you, which will change their placement at a short amount of time and will shoot at you by changing into a spear that will have little light-like mechanical attacks that you will need to avoid quickly when the orb starts flickering. I did have trouble with this part at first, but when I paid attention to the pattern of his attacks, it all came together. Granted, I did die a lot when figuring that out, but hey, nobody is perfect. Next, you'll need to do the best you can to hit Greedy about a total of 10 times. But be cautious, because he'll try to zoom across everywhere, and that can sometimes be at you. Then, whenever you see him up the air, he'll make his orbits rotate around him and attempt to throw them at you. You'll have to constantly dodge them left and right when he runs out of orbits, or either quickly hit him underneath. When you hit him the fifth time, Greedy will create a black hole to try to suck you in. Noticing quite the bit of sucking in this review. And speaking of sucking, I've kind of used the suck at this part. When Greedy is trying to suck you in, he'll try to pull a fast one by throwing his orbits at you. They won't always hit you, but sometimes they will, which can sometimes get you sucked in. Or, if it's not that, it's constantly spamming the grab button while doing your damnness to not get sucked in in his black hole portal and not get hit by the orblets. Whether they're thrown at you or coming towards you, when it hits you, it sucks you in his portal and it sucks, suck, it sucks! Fuck! Fuck! Put your back into it! I think I overused this joke. But yeah, he'll start throwing his orblets at you again to try to damage you to throw you off. Just walk and hold the right directional button to the right side and keep spamming the grab button to avoid that from happening. It'll rarely happen if you keep doing that. Next, Greedy will try to attack you with his laser when he starts flickering. When that happens, move quickly to the far left and then when he starts to strike, get ready to form a pattern to react quickly by juking left and right constantly. When he strikes four times at you when he's done, make sure to grab and attack him quickly before he creates another black hole. You can also grab and attack him whenever he's prepared to do his laser attack too. Hit him five times and Greedy will be done for. Greedy will be carried away with Inani... Fuck it. His minion. And his ship will start exploding and Rystar escapes. That's the end of the game. As a whole of gameplay-wise, Rystar to me is just skill and pattern paced. Sure, it can get a little difficult, but as I said before, most of it was my fault. And I mean, hey, without a little bit of difficulty, where's the fun in the challenge of a game? Speaking of challenge, you can also adjust the level's difficulty setting to either normal or, well, difficult. You can also collect certain objects and bonus levels by finding these things called star handles in every level of the game. When you use them, you'll be transported to that bonus stage to grab the special objects to get bonus points on your score or cheats from the game. I never bothered with these, but if it's something you're interested in, be my guess. But be warned, each bonus level will get much more challenging when trying to get those special objects. As visuals and graphics goes, Rystar is pleasing to look at, retro-wise. Levels like Planet Flora to Greedy's Castle are stunning to the eyes, and the galaxy and each planets are amazing and exudes passion and personality, and it all came from the Sega Genesis. While I've never owned one myself, as I stated before, I could imagine that this kind of thing would have been amazing to look at either way for me, Genesis or not. And finally, I should now talk about the music. I love it. The songs to me screams Genesis. 
I know that might not make a whole lot of sense, but if you played specific games on the SNES or Genesis, or a collection of games for the two consoles and listened specifically to their music, or as they're called, FM synthesizer chips, it can be really telling. I loved and enjoyed every planet's music. It feels like it fits the atmosphere as you continue on perfectly. But if I had to choose which music is my personal favorite, it has to be Beyond Space. It's really mesmerizing and sounds outstanding. It makes you feel wholesome, like you triumph over evil and prevail throughout space of the galaxy. The song and every other theme sounds all alien-like. No, I'm not talking about the movie, though that is amazing. <laughs> or horrifying. No, I mean it gives you space-like vibes, like you're a native visiting an alien planet, if that makes sense in itself. Well, I guess that doesn't matter, I still love the song, and the rest are amazing. The songs were composed by Tomoko Sasaki, whose name might be a little familiar to some. She composed music for Sega, mostly known for Knights, but also for this game too. And if you're a Sonic fan like me, she also voiced the Chows in the Sonic the Hedgehog series. Yet another bizarre link to the Sonic series again. At this point, Rystar's world should be connected to Sonic. Well, I mean, minus these games, because they're not canon. So that was Rystar, and as a whole, I think it's a pretty decent and fun game. It controls okay, I get a kick out of Rystar's pole swinging. The levels and designs for it aren't too bad, but could be a little better. And the music as a whole is spectacular. And this would be the first and last game to ever show this character. Yeah, after this game, Sega never acknowledged him ever again. Okay, well, I shouldn't say never acknowledged. He made guest appearances in games like the Shinmu series, which I haven't played yet. I have a Dreamcast, but not many games for it. The Sonic Racing series, more specifically All-Star Racing and Racing Transformed. But as far as official games goes, yeah, there were next to none. An IP that was at first going to be another representative for Sega and all their characters as a whole, now later just tossed to the backside of obscurity with Alex Kidd. He was just completely left in the dark for some time. But maybe that might change. Recently, Sega has seemed to be giving more of their IPs more attention, like Alex Kidd, as I mentioned before, and Streets of Rage to the developers merge. Streets of Rage 4 was well received, so I would love to see how they could handle the shooting star in a new game. Or, heck, maybe give Rystar to the developers Galaxy Trail. They made a fantastic 2D pixel game seemingly revolving around space with a certain crimson purple female dragon that I'll later consider looking into next time. And this might, and don't take my word as complete sound, this is just a guess, lead to more of Sega's IP getting attention again. So if that happens, we could possibly get another 2D Rystar game from Merge, Galaxy Trail, or both working together on it. That would be so cool! Hey guys, Mr. Iconics here. Before I end the video, I want to offer my last thoughts on who I would want to make the next new 2D pixel 16-bit, uh... Genesis Rystar type game. Uh, and those people would be the people that did Sonic Mania or Sonic Mania Plus. Uh, I think they're, they've proved them to be competent in handling like a 2D based Genesis 16 bit type games. And I would love to see how they would have handled as well um, with the Yellow Shooting Star for his next new game if they ever could get the chance. I know that might might not happen um considering the news of what I've heard about uh, uh their departure from Sega and they're doing their own thing or maybe they'll possibly come back later if the chance is given in the time but I mean 
if the possibility shows itself, I would also want um, Pagoda West, Head Cannon, and Christian Whitehead to do the next Rystar game if they are familiar with the franchise. So, yeah. Um, yeah back to the video. <laughs> If that happens, I would be down for that if it shows some promise. You can get and play Ristar for Steam, Sonic Mega Collection and Mega Collection Plus, Sega Genesis Collection, Sonic Ultimate Genesis Collection as I said before, or the original Genesis version if you have a Genesis and the game, which I think you're lucky if you do, and the Sega Forever service. <laughs> It's a game from the 16-bit era that was really limited, but really pushed the limits with its ambition, and the many reasons I love Sega. When they're doing things right. 